Hey everybody, welcome back to another video in our series on caring during cooling this April, 2023 in honor of HIE Awareness Month. This week's episode has to do with ventilating during cooling and Dr. Mohamed El Dib goes through the implications of cooling on the respiratory system as well as the basics of HIE and how that impacts the pulmonary system and complicates the management for these babies. This presentation is filled with great science and practical suggestions and we have a really rich Q&A session at the end and we go way beyond the respiratory system and discuss sedation and other aspects of caring for these babies during cooling. I hope that you enjoy this presentation. And if you'd like the slides, you can take a picture of the QR code here on the screen or click the link in the show notes below. We mentioned several articles as well as guidelines, which will be available on that page as well. I hope you enjoy this presentation with Dr. Mohammed El Dib. So welcome, welcome again. And we are excited to be here all together for this mini series of lectures. And again, just as a reminder for those of you joining, this is HIE Awareness Month. And that's, that is April every year. And Hope for HIE, the parent organization brought that to our attention. Cooling is an accepted practice, but there is so much more that we can do for these babies. And that's why we're here to really begin to explore the controversies and to explore what more we can do. Oh, we are cooling babies before six hours, or maybe you extend that a little bit longer. You do for 72 hours. They are at 33.5 for those 72 hours. You rewarm, you get an MRI, you send them to follow up, but there's more. There's so much more that happens in those 72 hours that I want to make sure that we, that we don't miss that. So again, for those of you who are new to Synapse Care, my name is Kathy Randall and I am a neonatal nurse practitioner. And we are here because we love to support nurses, physicians, therapists, families, and within all things NeuroNICU. And I started over a decade ago creating NeuroNICUs around the world and helping to support those. And it's so fun to be able to be back here and to support this month-long awareness. So really now, without further ado, I hope everybody who's planning to be with us live um, is here. It's my honor and privilege to introduce a dear friend and amazing research partner and colleague and really facilitator of all things baby brains in his unit as well as around the world, Dr. Mohammed El Dib. He is an attending neonatologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He is the medical director of their neurointensive critical care unit for newborns and the president of the Newborn Brain Society. So without further ado, Dr. Mohammed El Dib, thank you for being with us and for all you do for baby brains. Thank you, Kathy. I learned a lot from you and I think I I hope I have one fraction of your energy and be able to achieve a fraction of what you achieved over the years. And it's my pleasure to be presenting today a topic that is very close to my heart, the relation between the lung and brain. I sometimes we call it like lung brain access. As we're cooling more and more babies, it's very important to understand how the respiratory system and the brain interacts. So my talk today is about respiratory management during therapeutic hypothermia for neonatal encephalopathy. We all know that babies exposed to hypoxic ischemic insult around time of birth are at risk for brain injury and neonatal encephalopathy. We also know that hypothermia is now the standard of care to try to protect brains for babies who have encephalopathy. How does hypoxia ischemia affect the pulmonary system? As well as we're going these babies, how does hypothermia affect the lung? And most importantly, how does our respiratory management affect the brain? So my objective today is to understand the respiratory function changes in infants following hypoxic ischemic insult to discuss the effect of hypothermia on the lungs, to understand the effect of oxygenation and ventilation on newborn brain, and to appreciate the importance of respiratory managing as well as monitoring in infants with neonatal encephalopathy. So let's start by the hypoxic ischemic insult. How does this affect the respiratory system? 
we know that if you have a significant uh, brain injury that includes the brainstem, you're very at high risk to develop apnea. And also for babies who have significant seizure and status epilepticus, this can definitely affect their breathing. We also know that hypoxia, uh, especially before birth, intrauterine can lead to meconium intrauterine. So we always think about meconium being a marker of prenatal stress, and this could be leading to inhalation of this meconium can lead to inflammation and direct lung injury. Actually, there's evidence that also acidosis can lead to increased pulmonary capillary permeability, surfactant inactivation, and the RDS picture. And there are reports of pulmonary hemorrhage to be associated with that. And also, we know that one of the insulting factors that can induce pulmonary hypertension is hypoxia. We know that before the time of birth, usually an increase in pulmonary vasodilators and decrease in vasoconstrictors. But what happens, hypoxia actually inhibits the nitric oxide synthase, which ends by increased pulmonary vasoconstriction leading to pulmonary hypertension. So we know that from the get-go, these babies who have significant hypoxic insult are at high risk for a lot of pulmonary complications. And the question is, how does hypothermia affect the respiratory function? Does it make it better? Does it make it worse? I can say that the evidence is not great, so there's not a lot of information. We don't have a lot of information from the randomized clinical trial to, to really touch on that. However, with the limited data we have, it's likely that hypothermia would be more beneficial than harmful. So there is evidence that it can decrease some oxygen consumption because it does decrease the metabolic rate. But there's also some evidence that it can increase minute ventilation and increase surfactant activity. Again, I would not be really f- going on to super details of studies to make my talk more practical, but this again, one example of a retrospective study where they looked at 31 mechanically ventilated babies receiving hypothermia. And in this study, they could find that as time starting hypothermia, they noted decrease in FiO2, decrease in the mean airway pressure, the oxygenation index and the gradient. And there was an increase in compliance tidal volume and as well as what they call ventilation efficiency index. And this one of the curves in this paper would just demonstrate that there was a trend towards increased mechanical ventilation just during the time of hypothermia. And I think the questions that always come up, okay, what about pulmonary hypertension? Because there is a concern that when you cool these babies, this can cause more pulmonary vasoconstriction. And eventually there are some studies that pointed that there might be actually, yes, that with pulmonary hypertension and cooling, you might have increased FI2 and you might have increased inhaled nitric oxide use. But if you look in the randomized trial, so this graph is from meta-analysis of the different randomized trial to look at the question, if pulmonary hypertension is more in babies who got cooled versus babies who were not cooled, you can see that there was trend towards increase, but this did not reach statistical significance. So officially, you cannot say that the evidence say that babies who are cooled have increased risk of pulmonary hypertension. And as I said, meconium aspiration is a common thing that can be in association with neonatal encephalopathy. And again, very small studies. This was a retrospective multi-center study. They looked at babies who got cooled with meconium aspiration versus babies who had meconium aspiration but did not need cooling. So there is a very much limitation to how this study was designed. But overall, as a trend, what they found that babies who have meconium aspiration and cold have lower oxygenation index, as shown on the graph to the left, they have actually uh, reduced duration of mechanical ventilation, reduced total respiratory support, ICU stay, hospital stay. So as I said, this is just indications that very likely that cooling is more beneficial than being harmful. 
in this situation. As we are cooling more and more babies, you would see that you are starting to see different things that was not reported before. So one of the observations that I have seen a couple of times that babies start to have stridor, especially during late and like cooling and rewarming. And usually that's transient. And this has been again reported in a very small case report published in pediatrics just a few years ago. It's very unclear what is the etiology of this stridor, but usually it's very self-limited. And one of the other things we have observed locally here at the Brigham that we notice that sometimes at time of rewarming that babies start to require oxygen. The baby was born has no respiratory support and suddenly as you start to rewarm them, they start to need oxygen. And again, we tried to look into this to see retrospectively in our data how common this is, what are the factors associated with it. And so we looked retrospectively over 30 months and we can see that uh, out of 136 babies, only 46 were intubated, while 90 were not intubated. So we have about one third of our babies who get cold, get intubated, and this could be related to that we actually cool milder cases or at least half of our patients are on the mild degree. And then we looked at those who got never intubated. Part of them got some non-invasive support, but we had 49 babies who had no support whatever. And we have nine babies who actually fulfilled this phenomena that this baby did not need any support and suddenly start to need some oxygen. And we try to understand, okay, why would baby need new oxygen requirement? And the hypothesis is probably as time of rewarming, these babies have increased oxygen consumption. And maybe with a borderline pulmonary function, this could be manifested by increased oxygen need. Another hypothesis is that maybe there's again this shift of oxygen to situation curve to the right, so that can be associated with lower saturation. Adding to this, actually, we know that in our uh, NICU, our threshold really for treating hypoxia could be higher than other centers. And so it was a phenomenon. And again, we observed it like it happens more about day four. So again, about the time of warming, usually it lasts just for a few days. So the median was about seven days. None of these babies needed more than just low flow nasal cannula. And only three got an X-ray, two got an echo, and these were normal. So again, we don't have good explanation for this, but it's a phenomenon that I think it's good that people are aware of. So if you start to see this, you shouldn't panic. You definitely need to do the right investigations to work this out. But again, it seems that this is something that we are seeing. And we try to see maybe these are babies who are sicker than babies who do not need any oxygen requirements. And eventually we found the opposite. There was a trend that babies who have late oxygen requirements like this in green, compared to those who needed no support and those who needed some support, that actually they have higher pH, less base deficit, less lactate and maybe even higher alcohol score. So basically, we couldn't answer exactly if this is, it's not definitely a marker of this baby being sicker. Eventually, we could find some hypothesis to say, maybe if you're not sick, you actually have more ground fat depletion because we know that if you're sicker, you're not able to do this. And this might actually lead to increased oxygen consumption at your warming. So in summary, we think that hypoxic ischemic insult can lead to apnea, pulmonary hypertension, meconium aspiration, ARDS, and pulmonary hemorrhage. Hypothermia, again, not a lot of data, but overall decreased oxygen consumption, increased minute ventilation, increased surfactant activity. And we are seeing some babies who have stridor and maybe late oxygen requirements at the end of cooling. So what should we do? Should we intubate these babies and do mechanical ventilation? How should we manage their blood gases? Should we give the C2 high or low? Should we hyperoxygenate, give less oxygen? And how should we manage the other morbidities? So commonly cited, why we intubate a baby? As I said, okay, baby's not breathing, okay? Baby has altered level of consciousness. There's seizures that baby need an airway. And some centers say, okay, no, cooling equal intubation. Eventually, when you look at now, like all data from the VON registry, 
about 64% of babies who receive the hypothermia were mechanically ventilated. As I mentioned, in our unit, it's about one third. And as I said, it's probably related also to half of our patients being in the mild degree. Does it matter? Does ventilation matter? Uh, I think it does matter because once you put the baby that you've in and you start to ventilate the baby, you actually have more control than the baby and then things can not work all the time as you want. So this was a study, a retrospective study from Montreal, where they looked at 198 babies receiving hypothermia and 54% had brain uh, injury on their MRI and 71% were intubated. And they looked at those who are intubated versus those who are not intubated. So the non-intubated is the one which has the white bars and the hashtag bars are the intubated ones. And what they found that babies who are intubated tend to have lower CO2 in day one and two and have higher CO2 in day three and four. And so they basically had a higher, like a lot of fluctuation in their CO2. They also tried to look at mode of ventilation. And what they found that when you do synchronized intermittent ventilation without any or with minimal pressure support compared to so many other types of ventilation, this mode of ventilation is the one closest to babies who are naturally breathing. So again, the intubation by itself, if it's needed, you have to be very careful about what happens after that. And once you intubate the baby, the question, okay, now you're cooling the baby. Should you also try to cool the air or to make it cold so you don't lose the benefit of your hypothermia? So that's not a good idea. Actually, you need to provide 100% humidified gas for any baby who's receiving ventilation. And this need to be able to achieve this, the temperature of the gas should be 37 degrees. If you try to lower your temperature to 33 degrees, to match the body temperature, this can have high risk of lung injury, worsen pulmonary mechanics, and bronchospasm. So even during hypothermia, when you talk about the respiratory gas, the ventilatory gas, you should keep it warm. And then one of the things which I talk a lot about it is low carbon dioxide and the brain. We know that hypocarbia is common in babies who have encephalopathy or are receiving hypothermia. And the reason for that, because we know that many of these babies have metabolic acidosis and they have compensatory hyperventilation. In addition, there is impaired energy metabolism and secondary cerebral perfusion in those who have severe injury that can lead to reduced CO2 production. So that's what the HIE problem, but what about hypothermia? Hypothermia, in addition, decreases metabolic rate and increase the solubility of the gas in the blood. So eventually, we know that for every one point degrees in body temperature, your PCO2 drops by three to four degrees. So you are starting with a population that's already high risk for CO2 and probably cooling would make this CO2 even lower. Does it matter? Yeah, we'll talk about this. But also, as the PCO2 goes down, the pH goes up. So for every one point decrease in your temperature, your pH will also increase. So how should we manage that? So there are two ways of doing this. You can do what's called alpha stat management or pH stat management. I would just say that we think that the pH stat management is a correct way to try to manage these babies, although we know that most studies are needed. And what does it mean? This basically means that when you take a blood gas, and you go and analyze it, you enter in the blood gas machine, the actual patient temperature, which typically would be about 33 and a half. So you are analyzing this gas based on the baby's temperature, not based on 37 degrees. Why is that important? It is important because if you don't do this and you use 37 degrees, your CO2 will artificially look higher your pH will artificially look lower. And what are you going to do? You're going to go to the vent and actually increase your rate, increase your mid ventilation. So you will make this baby more hypocarbic. 
I think that's a very important message. You, everyone should be very clear. Whenever you do a blood gas, you're going to use the actual baby's temperature to analyze this blood gas. Okay, again, why, why is all talk about hypocarbia? Because hypocarbia is neurotoxin. We worry about hypocarbia because it can actually cause cerebral vasoconstriction, so you can decrease the amount of blood going to the brain. Low CO2 is associated with neuronal excitability, left shift of the oxyhemoglobin curve, and actually can induce apoptotic cell death. So we know low CO2 is never a good idea for the brain. We know it for preterm babies who have higher risk of PVL, and we know it even in term babies who have HIE or are getting hypothermia. So when they looked at large randomized trials, so this paper was from the NICHD trial, and they looked at the CO2 from birth to about 16 hours of life, which is 12 hours post-intervention. And they looked at the cumulative exposure to hypocarbia, which was defined as CO2 less than 35, and they divided babies into percentile. So I, they could find that the more exposure to cumulative hypocarbia, the more these babies are at risk for death or disability. It was very interesting to me to see if this will apply to our population, especially, as I said, that we call more milder cases. This paper was accepted finally for publication in Journal of Perinatology. Its the first author is Eniko Zachner, who was a fellow at our unit in 2019 to now, and she's now also a collaborator from Hungary and wonderful group of the team members. So basically, we looked at our data at the Brigham. We had 188 patients who received hypothermia during the study period. As I mentioned, about half of them were mild and the rest were moderate to severe. And basically, we looked at all gases done for these babies in the first 24 hours. It was a mixture of arterial, venous, and capillary gases. And we looked at their MRI and we classified them based on the weak classification. And basically what we found was there was positive association between the hours spent in the apneic hypocarbic range, less than 35, and the total MRI score. And this was the same when we adjusted for five-minute upgrade score and postnatal pH, which means that the MRI injury score increased by 6% for each extra hour spent in the hypocarbic. However, we found this relation just in the moderate to severe babies, and we didn't find it in those who have mild encephalopathy. So what should we do? If this baby is mechanically ventilated, please keep the CO2 within normal range and avoid hypocarbia. You try to keep the baby normal carbic using temperature-corrected blood gas. It's more difficult if there is spontaneous to breathing because there is little you can do to correct that. However, some people tried. So again, I published this paper in 2020 about a multicenter trial that they did to try to give babies actually CO2 and their ventilator gas. In these 10 babies, they found that it was feasible and safe. Is it neuroprotective to give babies CO2? It's hard to know. I think there are animal data at least that showed that adding CO2 to hypothermia might actually abolish the new protective rule of hypothermia. So I'm not sure if people are willing to investigate this any further. Although this talk is about respiratory system, I want to touch on metabolic acidosis because this is another thing. Okay, now the baby is acidotic. The baby's pH is 6.9. Your CO2 is low. Let's try to correct this acidosis. You told me that the CO2 is bad. Let me correct the pH. Your CO2 will get better. I also don't think that's a good idea. So we know that metabolic acidosis is a landmark for encephalopathy and is associated with worse injury and maybe worse outcome. But we know that it takes time for the body to compensate for this to correct the acidosis. And sometimes the persistence of acidosis is actually a sign that you need to look for other etiologies. I still think there is a room if the baby is hypovolemic to give normal saline, if the baby is acutely at a blood loss to give blood transfusion. But I want to make sure that you don't look at acidosis, that it's really the thing you are trying to treat. 
to protect the brain. Eventually, we need to look at the data. Is acidemia neurotoxic? Actually, what you find is the opposite. Acidemia could be actually neuroprotective because it can help deliver your function to the brain. It actually can be associated with decreased brain excitotoxicity. And on the other hand, alkaline intracellular pH has been associated with brain injury. And definitely, I don't give bicarb. Again, bicarb has been debated for years, has been obsolete for the last decade to be used in NRP. During resuscitation, we don't use it. I think the same applies here. Bicarb can cause hyperosmolarity, can increase CO2 production. But I think it, the problem can actually also cause unpredictable change in the intracellular pH. And some data show that it can actually worsen your lactic acidosis. So do not give bicarb even when you think the baby is acidotic and you want to correct your CO2. We don't think that's a good idea. What about hypercarbia? I would say, as everything in neonatology, you want to be moderate in everything. No, too much, not too low. Because hypercarbia by itself can also carry more risk on the brain. What about oxygen? Okay, so we know CO2, we keep it stable as much as we can. If we have control, if there is acidotic, we need to give it more time for the acidosis to resolve. The effect of oxygen is a little different because what happens when you cool the baby, you shift the oxygen situation curve to the left, so you increase the hemoglobin affinity to oxygen. Okay, so you're not getting much oxygen to the tissues, but at the same time, the oxygen demand is actually decreased. So overall, you have a more stable oxygen content. So should we give less oxygen or too much oxygen for these babies? So first of all, don't think that because it's called hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy that giving oxygen can help. We know that oxygen is a medicine. We know that hyperoxia is neurotoxic. And this is just one graph from a paper that shows all these cells, including neurons, oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, microglia, are affected by hyperoxia through so many mechanisms leading to brain injury. And we know that we are not using oxygen during resuscitation because simply the studies show that when you give oxygen during resuscitation, there is increased mortality in these babies. So oxygen is not always the answer. And there was actually a trend toward the increased risk of moderate to severe HIE, although this did not reach statistical significance. What about pulmonary hypertension and meconium aspiration? My only advice would be treat these entities based on your institution protocols. Don't think that stopping cooling is be the way to go to improve the outcomes of these babies. Even if the baby needs ECMO, you should do what the baby needs. But the ECMO has been a little debate also, a controversial topic. ECMO and cooling, does it work? I would say that even years ago, this was paper from uh, Anne Massaro in DC uh, Children talking about babies who got experience of hypothermia with ECMO. Many other reports raise a concern about ECMO and bleeding. But I think when you read these reports, you really need to look carefully which groups are we comparing. Because if you are comparing all ECMO babies and all ECMO babies who got hypothermia, yeah, you're more likely to have more hemorrhage. But the question is, is the hemorrhage due to the hypothermia or is it due to the original cause why you are cooling this baby? Is it related to the HIE or the hypoxic ischemic insulin? I think this paper, which came from for your life support organization just a few years ago, I think this is the best to compare apple to apple. Basically, they compared babies who have HIE, who got ECMO and cooling, to those who got HIE and ECMO but did not get cooling. And in this study, they did not see any difference in demographic, severity of illness, complications, or mortality. I think this is still a big question, but I think based at least on this data, it's not very clear if the hypothermia overall increases the risk in these babies. 
Okay, in summary, auction is bad. Hypochromia is terrible. Do not intubate this baby. Correct temperature for blood gas, manage pH, and mycorium aspiration. And I wouldn't leave this opportunity without talking about respiratory monitoring because monitoring and your monitoring is also one of my passions. And one of the important things, if hypochromia is that bad, can we actually monitor low seed in a better way than repeating this blood gas here and there during hypothermia? And we use transcutaneous CO2 in our unit a lot in preterm babies. And the question is, does transcutaneous CO2 monitor help in monitoring babies who have hypothermia? And there is an ongoing study that we are doing at the Brigham and Women's Hospital where we actually are testing this hypothesis to see if, if the transcutaneous CO2 will correlate with blood CO2 in babies receiving hypothermia. And this is, again, the, this is an ongoing study. We just presented a preliminary data at Chelsea Monster, the research assistant who's worked with me for years, I presented this during the International Newborn Brain Conference. And basically, we just had 28 patients, 61 blood gas measurements. If you just collectively look at the gases, there was no difference in the CO2 between the transcutaneous or the blood. If you try to do a correlation analysis, there was some positive correlation, which was statistically significant. But the biggest question, how far the number you're getting? So when you look at the TCOM, how far this is from your blood gas, I would say, again, this was not the greatest match between your skin and your blood. However, 72% of these samples had a difference less than 10 millimeter, but the range has been, again, between minus into plus 15. So we are working now to see how can we optimize this tool to better correlate with CO2, we still think it can be used well as a trending device. And suddenly, as we're doing the study, another paper came out from the Netherlands, looking exactly at the same question using RTL gas. This was a retrospective study. And so far, I think their findings are very similar to ours so far. But I think we have opportunity for this prospective study to work on how we can make this transcutaneous CO2 to work better. So more to come about that. And the other thing is, does it matter to measure the brain oxygenation? And I think, yes, because we know that measuring brain oxygenation or cerebral oxygenation using NEARS was able to differentiate babies who have poor outcome from babies who have normal outcome. And as shown in this graph from an old paper from the Netherlands again, babies who have received hypothermia and had poor outcome, which shown in this dashed line, had higher cerebral saturation than babies who had normal outcome. And the hypothesis is that probably this is related to decreased oxygen extraction, but maybe actually more likely increased perfusion in these babies. We also try to apply the same concept in our unit. We have been using NEARS for clinical monitoring for babies receiving hypothermia since 2018. And so we looked at just a short period between January 18 to May 2019. And we looked at 53 babies who got hypothermia or 49 had NEARS recording. And about half of them had no injury and half of them had brain injury. And we did see very similar finding. Babies who have brain injury at higher cerebral saturation at day four, it was overall higher, but it reached statistical significance at day four. And when you specifically looked at the deep gray matter, eventually it was also higher in those who have injury. And this was statistically significant at day two and day four. So we continue to use our cerebral saturation as one of the biomarkers for severity of injury to help us with prognosis in these babies. So let me summarize what I said today. Hypoxia ischemia can cause a significant effect on the pulmonary system. 
within that hypothermia can also have significant effect, but this is most likely protective. We know that what we do affects the brain. So how much oxygen are you giving, how much oxygen the baby is seeing, also how much carbon dioxide the baby has, are you exposing the baby to hypo or hypercarbia? All these things affect your brain. And if you want practical guideline, as I said, to intubate only if indicated. If ventilated, please warm and humidify the ventilatory gas. When you do a blood gas, please correct for baby's temperature. Try to maintain normal cardia if you can. Maintain normal oxygenation and manage comorbidities as they come. And as you are monitoring your baby with your cardiovascular monitor and monitoring by EEG, please pay attention to your ventilator and your ventilator settings. Please monitor your brain oxygenation using mirrors. And hopefully soon we can say, consider using transcutaneous CO2 to monitor your CO2 level. And this is a real picture from one of our NICU rooms which again, any echo uh, Zachmar did in our paper from 2019, showing that we monitor these babies a lot. We pay attention to everything we are getting because we think that everything we do on the bedside eventually matters for this baby's brain. And uh, this information presented today, we're publishing two manuscripts, one in Journal of Prenatology in 2019, but also we recently published an updated paper as part of the two issues published on behalf of the Newborn Brain Society Guidelines and Publication Committee and Seminars of Fetal and United Medicine. So please feel free to review these two papers and reach out to me if you have any questions. I would love to thank all my mentors, colleagues, and collaborators. I just put the names here for that's really a subgroup of the people who are helping me every day. I was trying to put people who actually help with work that's related to the studies I presented today. Thank you all. And I have to say, if you're not part of the Newborn Brain Society, please do join it. Look at our website, join us. And I think this will be very helpful because we really want to expand our audience our group it's a multidisciplinary society that we really want to have more nurses more respiratory therapists more neonatal therapists and other disciplines joining us thank you thank you so much mohammed that was quite a review and i know that there are going to be some questions coming up now that we were here i actually see that we have a few raised hands and i see some questions in the q a as well as in the chat i am if you're in a place where you would like to to ask your question orally just raise your hand and i can unmute you and um and we can do it that way. But while I'm waiting for you to raise your hands, let me go ahead and ask a couple of the questions that are in the chat and Q&A for you. So number one, which I think is a really great question from a nurse in California, Anne, she says, how is, how is it that the esophageal probe doesn't register when we use the warmer gases? And we know it doesn't because we know we're able to titrate that core temperature, but just how does that work physiologically or practically that the CPAP doesn't skew that temp with the sensor in the esophagus? I think it's a very smart question. And I think that's really, I think the only caveat that my experience has been very limited to a rectal probe because that's what we are using in the current devices. And I think that if you are mechanically ventilated, I think that's definitely not a problem. And I think the question would be if you're using CPAP and if you have all warmer air going to your airway and your esophagus. And I, again, I have no practical experience. I think that's a very good question. And I'd like to hear how do you, how do they do and how they react to this problem do they actually cool down the air or how does this work so i can just speak for the places i've been most places still use 37 and yet it seems i don't know if it's deep enough and that it gets to that kind of core temp 
and doesn't affect it. I don't know that anybody's probably correlated a rectal and an esophageal to see the differential like with and without respiratory support. I don't think anyone's done that. Yeah. Even in animal studies, I don't think it's been done. So it is a good question. And, and generally speaking, I would like at least my imagination that the esophagus is continuously collapsed yeah. Yeah. on the probe so that overall it should be reflecting the temperature. Yeah. I think the air goes probably like not continuously. It probably at certain time when babies like swallow or like cry. So I think the effect will not be continuous. I think that very likely it still reflect what those original temperature is. But I still think it, it is a very good question. Awesome. Thanks, Anne, for that, as always. A great question. So there's a couple different questions about morphine. And so maybe start with kind of your unit's position on the utilization of morphine for preventing anxiety and stress and shivering in your unit and what you're doing for that. And then maybe I'll talk to about these other questions as well. Yeah, I think the whole idea of sedation with hypothermia is also one of the controversies that people talk about. I think there, there was some data, uh, Marianne Toshin showed like many years ago that maybe if you, an animal model, if you don't give anesthesia with schooling, actually you don't achieve the hypothermia effect. But people, again, not sure if this has been proven in human. And I think the randomized trial, just the secondary analysis was not very conclusive about this. However, we think that it can cause some discomfort. I personally don't think that cooling is painful because as you all know, when you touch your cooling blanket, it's most of the time warm, it's not cold. So I don't think it's painful. I think it is more uncomfortable that babies don't like to be cold or not wrapped. Or, so that's always, there's some sort of discomfort. So we think that a little bit of morphine is good, but we also know that there are data that because of your metabolism being very slow, you can achieve very high level of morphine more than any other baby. So the way we dealt with this, again, this protocol, the, my, my mentor and professor, Dr. Terry Ender, put it before arriving here, just having a very strict protocol that we give, we start the first 12 hours by 0.01 milligram per kilogram per hour and strictly at 12 hours switch this to 0 0.005 so we drop it 50 percent and just maintain this very low dose morphine and there is some that it shouldn't be increased or except with that tending being involved so try to make it like really straight as much as possible and i think that the net effect of this is that most of the time, by the time you reward our babies, you're ready, ready to eat. If they have good neurological exam, looks good. They don't really take time to recover. As I said, many of our babies are not intubated. So giving very low dose of morphine that allow you not to intubate babies unnecessarily. And sometimes you have these very random babies who are very irritable and we give some next boluses or stay at 0.01, but I've never seen us going even higher than this. So I think we just, we're trying to take a balanced approach. We think that it's, it makes sense to make babies comfortable as you're not feeding them, you're putting them in a cold environment, they might start to shiver. So all this, I think it, it makes sense to use it, but you should be careful with it. Um, thank you for that. That's similar to the practice we do in California as well. We start at that extremely low dose. We titrate down 50%. We keep that to the day of rewarming. Then we cut the dose knowing that it's bioaccumulative, but that we'll start to clear it and hope that those babies can perk right up and have no effect for feedings as well. What about other medications? We talked a little bit about morphine and the theories around that, but what about other drugs? Are you studying some other things that you can talk about? What are some of the other pharmacological things you're doing? Sorry, there are little that we would do a routine. I think as a standard, babies who get cold will be started on a morphine drip, as I described. And unfortunately, we start all these babies on antibiotics still, but we are very careful not to use gentamicin as new nephrotoxic. So we will be amp at cefepime, which is available in our unit. Some places will run antibiotics until babies are rewarmed. We only use it for 
rule out sepsis, which mean like 48 hours and we stop it if the culture is negative. I think a baby who has encephalopathy, infection is always one of the differential. And so I think it's still uh, like, we, we, are, we don't have a very good way to, to select babies who really need this like, sepsis worker. And I, I would say that's, a, that's what we use routinely. For sedation, we stick to morphine. We, again, if you are in this very bad situation when you have severe pulmonary hypertension, you're, you're going up on your vent, you are giving nitric, we do, we treat this baby as our pulmonary patients. We try to sedate, mm-hmm. sometimes paralyze. But as I said, we keep cooling. We keep cooling till we call the ECMO center. We keep the baby cold. Uh, I think there's really no evidence that stopping cooling in these babies, especially the moderate to severe encephalopathy, will end by a better outcome. What about Presidex? Does that come up in your unit or? I think it will only come in the same population if you are giving very high dose sedation. We have not been using it routinely. We are using it in sick babies to try to reduce the amount of opiates. It's been very helpful even in preterm babies. I think the data from, uh, there are some data that concerning about it in the cooling population, but I think the centers that have been using it routinely of publishing their experience, and that's been very good. Most likely, again, if you are in the very low dose, you probably will do fine with the low dose morphine. I think if you are going to escalate sedation for any reason, probably you will want to look at other agents. And for neuroprotective agents, as everyone on this call knows, these are all under investigation. So we have not started using any agent as a neuroprotective agent because none of them have still shown to be beneficial in the large clinical trials. Someone is asking about using VEC for intubated babies. When is paralysis something that you consider? I don't think there's a specific rule for neuromuscular paralysis. I think there is still concern about long-term effect of any medication, including paralytic agents. I think there are some data from preterm babies. I don't think we have a lot of data about long-term outcome of using it. We use it only for babies we are very stuck, and this will be babies which basically pre-ECMO, that you are trying to do everything to make the baby really work well with the oscillator and sedate and paralyze and give nitric, and we would do everything. This will be the typical scenario. I was asked about, okay, should we give paralytic agent just one dose during intubation? I think this is, again, depends on your practice. And it was funny because this was a question raised by, I gave a talk two days to the transport team, which are used to do this. And they're saying, okay, neonatologists don't like to give paralytic agents. I think it's our nature because we worry that we think the baby's breathing, at least if you don't get the tube in. You're not stuck. I think we worry if you give paralytic agent that we will stop breathing and you don't get the tube in. But I think in theory, for intubation, you want the baby to be in the best situation. You want to decrease the baby fighting you. You want to decrease injury and stress around this procedure. So I personally don't have any concern to give it as one dose as part of the pre-medication for intubation. I think that's totally fine. Great. And a baby who's over breathing on the vent, blowing off their CO2, do you think there's ever a place for it in those scenarios? Or I don't think there's really, like, I think the weighing the risk and benefit doing this, I, I don't think, I wouldn't recommend that. But again, this is a very good point. Uh, I think you try to optimize your vent as much as possible to avoid hyperventilation. But it's a very good point. Yes, if you make this baby stop breathing, you might raise your CO2. But again, the question is always about the end. That's what we do every day. There's something that helps, but can make yeah. it worse. <laughs> the question is, what is the final outcome? Is like adding this benefit and risk will end by a benefit or risk? I think so far, I think that it's unclear. And I think I'd be more concerned about paralyzing these babies than just trying to live with their natural hypocarbia. Yeah, excellent. All right, so do you have time for two more questions? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So there was a question about Rilnirs. It's a fine line when we're giving that morphine and slowing the brain down a little bit from sedation. And then the effect of hypothermia or the impact of the actual ischemic injury. So how, if you're giving morphine, do you interpret that cerebral nears? Does morphine make you suspect anything? Do you hedge your bet on the injury if it's a little bit higher or do you not see an impact? I, I get from, from just purely from a practical standpoint, I have not seen this specific change when you give morphine, especially that we're giving as an infusion. I think the question is, so when you give one dose of morphine, what will happen? If it's a huge dose, you, we all know that the cerebral situation is very complex because the factors affecting it could be oxygen delivery and oxygen extraction. And you, when you give morphine, are you getting like hypoxic? Are you getting less oxygen going to the brain? But then if you actually suppress the brain activity, maybe you're actually getting less cerebral activity and you might actually have less extraction. Yeah. So because our tool is not great, because it measures so many different things, I don't know how to interpret the effect of morphine. I think it's a good question. I'm not sure if there's a lot of data outside to show how morphine affects cerebral nears. The hope in the future that we have better tools, which we are actually investigating here in the Harvard area, that can look specifically at cerebral blood flow, separate from oxygen consumption. And when we do this, we might be able to understand more the pathophysiology of the numbers we're getting. Yeah, excellent. Do you use two, the two-site or dual-site mirrors to correlate between during cooling or for your other populations? We have been using just cerebral mirrors for the last few years clinically for all extremely preterm babies and cooling babies. And it's very interesting. We're just trying to look into renal mirrors. So we are inviting Valerie Chuck from Stanford okay in just a few weeks to talk to us about renal mirrors and their experience. But I think this is another valuable tool, but I think it, it does actually make sense to be able to have these two tools together. Yeah, yeah. I always have a thousand questions myself, so I'm going to try to stick to the chat <laughs> for everyone. This is a question just about pre-transfer, so if you feel comfortable doing that. When you have babies who are outborn who are sent to the Brigham, do you give guidance about passive cooling? I have my own opinions, but I want to hear what you say about just how do you manage those babies at the facility, referring facility, to avoid hypothermia, the overcooling of these babies out in the field? Yeah, I think it needs to be protocolized. So we have a specific protocol for passive hypothermia, which exactly describe what should you do step by step. And depending if the temperature starts to drop too much, you need to start to warm the baby. And if the baby's not getting actually cold, like measures you can actually do to make the baby colder. But we actually, as also people have learned that we know we knew that active cooling during transport is feasible and better and when you do active cooling you are able to reach the cooling center in a more controlled temperature very close to your target our transport team for a year now they actually got the cooling device in all their stretchers and they're actively cooling babies during transport so we have not analyzed the data yet but so far basically you can start cooling immediately at the community center before waiting to arrive and the question again that was raised just a couple of days ago so if cooling very important start cooling immediately after the insult happens why don't people even in community center have cooling devices to put baby on it before transferring babies so i think it it's again it depends what's a comfort level and expertise but maybe this will be the future maybe not every center need to be a cooling center, but maybe every center know how to put the baby on the cooling device until the transport team arrives and take the baby. We're not there yet. I think we we're really considering testing this here in the Boston area uh, in one of our hospitals because we know that really it does matter. This few hours matters a lot. 
Yeah, I think, again, I would just echo what you're saying about you making sure that the it's a little bit dependent on the comfort level and how frequently they send you these kinds of babies, whether or not it, it will probably be feasible or practical to do. I think one of the things to do if you're feeling uncomfortable is to just not do passive cooling at all, but to change your set point to a lower set point and use your warming beds to prevent that dive reflex that we see that babies do sometimes and end up at 30 when that causes its own set of problems. I think even still using your skin probe or using an axillary temperature and just setting your set point at 36 or 35.5 or 34.5, someplace where they can't get below that point and just making sure that temp probe stays on the baby until the team arrives. I think it also helps to have them a little closer to normothermia so that your transport team can do a nice exam, an in-person exam. And I sometimes worry about the babies getting too cool too quick and then the exam maybe getting skewed for that first documentation. Most of the time we've made the decision to go and get the baby. So that buys the baby the cooling therapy. And I agree with you. We need to get that baby cooled as soon as possible, especially for long transports or in weather where you don't want that delay to creep out to four, five, and six hours. So I think that would be my caution is to remove passive cooling from your vocabulary and to always be intentional about temperature be intentional. I'm setting this baby's temperature to 34.5. I'm setting this baby's temperature to 35. And to not just turn off warmers, turn off temps, and just allow the baby to get too cold. That's where your transport teams are running into trouble. So passive cooling doesn't exist. You're either cooling or you're not cooling, and you should do it intentionally. And I think we should get rid of this whole passive cooling idea. I agree with you. Servo controlled devices on transport are 100% constant, continuous temperature monitoring, so important. But yeah, I agree with you, Mohammed, of using these devices in the field really do open up some new opportunities for us, especially with more telemedicine and maybe being able to get better exams by video early. Gosh, there are still some more questions. People are asking if you can share your protocol. Maybe we'll put some of these questions in the Facebook group and we can keep asking. So there's a question about still using cool cap. What do we do for um, severe coagulopathies? And there's even some questions about some other types of sedation. So I think I'll put those in the Facebook group and let that conversation continue there and people can start to, to share those. I will ask Mohammed if he can make a PDF of, his, of some of the slides that are shareable just for reference or even just your reference list. So I, I just want to say thank you, Mohammed, for being here, for really that amazing review of the background. I think it really is going to spur some more conversation and hopefully give some clarity for people on what to do in some of these challenging situations and some of these questions that we still have. Any final thoughts? No, thank you. And as I said, the Newborn Brain Society has published these uh, two uh, issues in the seminars of fetal neonatal medicine. And the, I think these papers really tackle all these questions one by one in a very comprehensive way. And I think the, those one collective paper specifically that was written by Bea Winter Marx, Sonia Bonifacio, and Khorsh and Muhammad that actually put all these together i really recommend it so i think uh, i would be happy to share links to these papers as well link to our protocol at the brigham because it's available online and the more is available for any questions by email or they and this nice group so thank you so much Kathy. Oh, thank you. But for today, we'll say thank you for your time. Thank you for that presentation. And thanks to all of you for being with us live. And for those of you watching the recording, we'll see you in the Facebook group. Thank you. Thank you again for being a part of our Caring During Cooling series in honor of HIE Awareness Month. If you are interested in the slides as well as any of the links to articles that Dr. Aldib mentioned, go ahead and click the uh, link in the show notes or use the QR code on the screen and you'll be able to be directed to a page that has all of those for you. Um, again, just thank you for being a part of our series and hopefully we'll see you next week when we're going to be talking with Dr. Lena Shalak on managing the conundrum of mild HIE. Thanks everybody. 